Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told of Untold. My name is Toho. I know I've been gone for a couple of weeks, but I did post in the community tab that I recently had knee surgery, so I've just taken a couple of time off to just focus on my recovery. And I just want to thank you guys so much for all the kind messages you left for me. I really do appreciate it, and I'm doing well, and I'm getting there. And I also have some good news. We're going to be having a giveaway. So Penguin Books, which is a publishing company, was so kind enough to send me two books to give to two subscribers so yeah um i covered i did a series on the profiler diaries i think a year ago um and it was a book by harold lamaskakni where he just spoke about different cases that he's covered he's a forensic psychologist and he's decided to write a second book and woo! we got it <laughs> so yes if you want to enter the giveaway all you need to do is leave a comment down below what you like about my channel and why you feel like you'd want to read this book and that's pretty much it and i'll let you guys know who the winners are in like a week so keep your keep your eyes open on the community tab so with that let's go straight into today's case Today we are going to be talking about the tragic murder of Sybil Zanner. The Strebels and the Zanners were old friends, but as time went on, the two families kind of drifted apart because the Zanners lived a different lifestyle. They were extremely wealthy, they would travel abroad almost every year, um, they had like this very glitzy lifestyle, and their one son, his name was Frank, it suited him very, very well. And there was this one year where they were taking a trip to Europe, so Frank's sister, her name was Corinna, she decided to invite her one friend and her name was Frog. and because Frank could invite someone as well he was living in Germany at the time and he had recently broken up with his girlfriend but his ex-girlfriend now had a friend that he was kind of looking at you know kind of liked her you know those vibes so he decided to invite her and her name was Sybil so Sybil, Fro, Corinna, Frank, they all went on this Europe tour and they had a really good time and during this trip this is where Frog and Sybil also formed sort of really good friendship and their friendship continued on for decades. At the time, Sybil was around 24 or 25 years old and she was described as being extremely beautiful. She had this all honey colored hair and honey colored legs and what was most attractive about her was her personality. Because Frog and Sybil were such good friends at this point, she had invited Sybil to come spend Christmas with her family in South Africa. I forgot to mention that Sybil was from Germany like she's a German so she came down to South Africa to spend Christmas with the Strabels and they also invited Frank and during this Christmas time Brigitte who was Frog's mother like pulled Frank to the side and just told him that you know this is a good woman she would make a good wife so you know just make the right decision and Frank listened to her because on their way back to Germany he decided to propose to her and once they got to Germany they had their wedding celebration there and not too long after that they decided to move back they decided to move to South Africa because Frank was from South Africa and his family's company was in South Africa and in due time he was supposed to take over the company so they moved to South Africa and this is where they had their second wedding with the rest of their friends and family that couldn't attend the wedding in Germany. At first the couple lived with Frank's parents but after some time they managed to buy their own home at the Waterford estate in Wittkopen which is in Joburg. At the time Sybil worked as a secretary for the German engineering firm called Steinmiller which supplied electric motors to mining companies among other things and at one point 
Frog and Sybil would like carpool together and they would have so much fun. Frog described her as someone who was very spontaneous. She was very kind, you know. She was the type of friend that she could call at midnight and say, let's go skinny dipping. And Sybil would be like, let's go. You know, that's the type of person that she was. Frank and Sybil had always wanted a family and after years of trying, Sybil finally fell pregnant in 1993 and she gave birth to a daughter and they decided to name her Bianca. Unfortunately, Bianca was born severely handicapped and she only lived for three weeks and this completely broke them. And Brigid remembers who is Frog's mother. She remembers how just strong Sybil was in that moment you know like she was distraught about Bianca and Bianca not like Bianca wasn't going to have a long life and Brigitte was so distraught about this and she just remembers Sybil just looking at her and Sybil telling her you know to just calm down you know just like relax and just for her to accept the way things were because they they couldn't change that they couldn't change Bianca's situation so the best that they could do was just accept it and she just remembers looking at Sybil and just seeing like just how strong she was you know and she couldn't believe it a couple of years later Frank convinced Sybil to adopt twin boys and at first Sybil was very hesitant she wasn't sure if she was going to be like a good loving mother and she also thought that it was going to be twice the amount of work because it's not just one baby it's two you know but eventually they did decide to adopt these twin boys and immediately she just went into mother mode you know she was a dedicated loving mother and she would do anything for her sons Things seem to be going really well, but with a lot of things in their marriage, Sybil was always the last to find out anything. And it was no different when she found out that Frank was having an affair. The Strabels had noticed that Frank was a bit distant. He would always seem distracted and he would doze off. And it was no different with Sybil. Sybil also noticed things about Frank and she knew that there was something wrong with their marriage but she really couldn't figure it out but then in May 2002 Frank decided to take Sybil out for dinner and there he confessed that he had he had been having an affair for two years with one of his colleagues and her name was Susanna and not only that but they had had a baby girl in August 2 thousand so to put it in other words or maybe just give you another perspective when frank was persuading sybil to adopt the twin boys his mistress was already pregnant so he's convincing his wife that they should adopt so they could start their family but like on the side he's already started his family like can you imagine can you imagine that and after that you know Sybil was very hurt rightfully so but she decided that they had to go tell the Strabels together because they were extremely close the Strabels were like her parents I'm not too sure what happened to her parents but like the Strabels were like her mom and dad. She would see them every week, you know, and she felt like it was just right for them to go over to their house and tell them that Frank had been having an affair and he had a child, you know? So they had planned to go to the Strabels, but on the specific day that they were going to tell the Strabels, Frank had gotten there first. But he had also left, like he left in a hurry and he left before Sybil arrived. So once Sybil arrived, she was just shocked to see that Frank wasn't there and Frank didn't even tell the Strabels what the conversation was about, like why they wanted to meet up with them. So she took it upon herself to tell them about Frank's affair and Frank's daughter. And they remember just looking at her and they, the first thing they asked was, are you going to get a divorce? And Sybil looked extremely shocked, like it was like almost the first time she had heard that or like the first time she had ever thought about a divorce, you know, like it hadn't been a thought before. And she just said no, that they were going to work on their relationship and she wasn't going to divorce him. 
And at the time, they thought it was very strange because I remember at some point, Sybil had mentioned that she would be able to forgive Frank for having a one night stand, but she wouldn't forgive Frank for having had like a long term affair, you know? But they also think the reason why she didn't want to have an affair is because who the Zana family were and just how wealthy they were so she knew that if she were if she was going to have if she was going to divorce frank then she wouldn't have that money you know she wouldn't have the comfortable life that she currently had and that's something that she wasn't going to do but over time it's as though like she accepted the affair and at one point she even started planning how they were going like how they should extend the house that they lived in like build another room for frank's daughter so that when she came during weekends she would be like she'd have her own room she'd have her own space and that's just the type of person civil was you know she was hurt but she was like there's nothing i can do about it now let me just be accepting of this daughter but apparently frank on the other hand had already went to go had already went out had seen a divorce lawyer and had been looking for apartments for him susanna and their daughter the week leading up to Sybil's death, she was unusually quiet and she wasn't herself. On the 25th of September 2002, Sybil drove to the Strabel's house just after 7.30pm and she parked her car on the pavement, she got out and locked her silver Audi A3 and she started walking towards the house no more than three meters from her car someone grabbed her so roughly that there was an instant bruise on her arm and the next moment a bolt from a crossbow pierced through the ligaments between her first and second vertebra instantly sybil is paralyzed and she falls on the floor unconscious Immediately her attacker flees and her handbag is still lying in the street with her wallet, her car keys and a piece of a wooden puzzle lying scattered on the floor. Harold and his wife Brigitte Strabel, who were Frog's parents, had been waiting for Sybil to arrive and they remember that night they were surprised because she was usually on time but on this specific day she was late so all three of them would meet up weekly and they would usually have a glass of wine and do arts and crafts usually Sybil would do some arts and crafts for her two sons and it was just a way for her to get away from her family you know the responsibilities of being a parent just for her to just unwind and be with you know the people that she saw as her parents so when she was late on this day they thought it was so weird and soon after that Harold heard the door knocking and he went there he opened the door and he was like Sybil you're late but it wasn't Sybil it was one of his neighbors and his neighbors told him to come outside quickly and that something weird had happened and as soon as they got outside he saw Sybil lying on the floor with a crossbow through her neck and she looked really peaceful but his first thought was like who could have done this like what happened not too long after that an ambulance and police officers arrived on the scene and Sybil was taken to the hospital and they then received the news that she wasn't going to make it and she was put on life support after that, the Strabels went to the Zana's house so they could look after the twin boys and then Frank went home but he got there pretty late and they remembered that once Frank got the news he seemed very distraught like he threw his car keys on the floor like burst into tears and that was that. But the next day when they woke up, Brigitte looked at him and asked where he was going and he said that he was going to work. And she thought it was so strange because she's like, are you not going to go visit your wife? Like, your wife isn't going to make it. They're going to take off life support, you know? Like, why are you going to work? And he just said that he would go see her soon. And not too long after that, they switched off the machines. 
and Sybil Zano passed away. The newspapers reported how Sybil's death sent shockwaves across the entire German community. And at a funeral at St. Thomas Lutheran Church in Bryanston, the church was full to capacity. Her friends and family from both South Africa and from Germany came. Some people sat outside on the grass, just there trying to pay their respects to Sybil. When the investigation began, the police officers literally had nothing to go on. And they told the public that this was one of the most bizarre cases they had ever covered in quite a while and they had nothing to go on. They literally had no evidence, they had no suspects, they had no motive, like they just had nothing, like a nothing. And then seven months later, they decided to hand over the case to Pete Bailefeld. Once Pete got the case, the first thing that he had to do was just look at the evidence that the police officers had, but they literally had nothing. They botched the entire crime scene, they botched the entire investigation, literally like the only thing he had were autopsy photos. He went to the crime scene and he realized that they didn't take any evidence. Her handbag, her car keys, everything that had been left on the floor, they just picked it up and threw it in the back seat of the car because it was immediately ruled that this wasn't a robbery because her things had been left behind. But it was like, what if there were fingerprints? What is like some sort of evidence on those things? But you guys didn't care to like even look. They didn't have a crime scene photographer on the scene so there were no photos of the crime scene there was just there was just like nothing there was absolutely nothing Pete Bailefeld then called the first investigating officer for the case and just tried to get her opinion about the case and what she thought and he asked about Sybil's husband Frank and immediately she said no she didn't think Frank did it and he asked why and she just said no during like our interviews he convinced me that she didn't do it and that he was innocent and immediately Pete just thought that you know they had built a friendship which meant that she couldn't be objective at all like you can't build a friendship with one of the suspects you know because you just can't do that. Why are you doing that? In the docket, Pete also found lie detector results and Frank had failed his lie detector test. However, his ex-brother-in-law who was married to his sister had passed his and his name was Eddie Bazinate. So Eddie had told them that a couple of years earlier, he had sold his own crossbow and arrows to Frank at about 300 Rand, you know, but Pete decided not to put much emphasis on the lie detector test because even though maybe it might show you something, it's not really accredited in court, you can't use it in court, so it was just there. Because Pete Bailefeld had to start investigating this case basically from the beginning, the first thing that he wanted to do was find out who Sybil Zanar was. So he wanted to go speak to some of her friends and colleagues. But once he got to her work office, he noticed how a lot of people were very hesitant and they didn't want to speak to him, maybe because he was a detective or they just didn't trust that he was going to do his job. But he did manage to speak to a couple of people and they told him that Sybil was a very nice person, like she did her work diligently and like had no problems, you know. It was also discovered that on the day that Sybil was murdered, she received a mysterious phone call between 12 and 1 p.m. And when she first got to the office that morning, she was very happy, she was in a cheerful mood. But after this phone call, her whole mood like completely changed and no one had ever seen Sybil that angry and that upset. Whilst she was on the phone, one of her colleagues went to her office just to like try and check on her and see if she was okay. And immediately she switched from English to German and he heard her say something along the lines of Frank. But that was it and after the phone call he went back to the office to check on her again and you know just find out what happened and all she said was men and then that was that and she left the office a couple of minutes after that. Pete tried to trace Pete tried to find the identity of the caller, 
but he was never able to find who called her that time and made her so upset. Frank's financial position also raised some questions. There were rumors earlier that year that part of Paul Zahner's factory, who was Frank's dad, had been liquidated and that Frank had tried to increase his mortgage to acquire cash. Another rumor was that two days before Sybil had died, Frank had made inquiries to Stain Miller's bookkeeper about the amount of money due to Sybil in her pension. Pete then ordered Stain Miller to stop any payments that they may consider giving to Frank. And on Pete's recommendation and with the investigation pending, the insurance company refused to pay out an amount of 440,000 Rand for a policy Frank had taken out on Sybil's life, of which she was the sole beneficiary. Four months after Sybil had been murdered, Frank went out on a date. And I don't know about you, but like four months after my wife of like, I don't know how many years, like a decade, over a decade, had died. Like four months is like too fast. It's too fast. But anyways, four months after Sybil had been murdered, Frank went out on a date with this woman. They only went out twice and they met each other through a mutual friend. But on this date, um, Frank didn't speak much about his wife. He spoke about the insurance money that he should have gotten and told this woman that like, he had one million rand from the insurance policy and then he made it sound like, you know, I'm getting a million rand. But it's only a million rand. But you know, it's a million rand either way. Like that's how he made it sound about him getting that money. And then when she asked him, like, how was Sybil, like, who was Sybil? And you know, like, how was she like? All Fred could say was, she was a great cook and a lot of people liked her. Pete then decided to look into the affair that Frank had with Susanna and he wondered whether or not Sybil had really forgiven him for the affair that he had had. As the investigation progressed, Pete decided to look into Frank's affair with Susanna and if Sybil had really forgiven him for his affair. It also turned out that Frank might have only confessed to Sybil about his affair because he was on the verge of being caught and that his relationship with Susanna had ended before that. But he didn't want to like let it go. She's the one that broke things off and he was very persistent he didn't want to let her go so that was a bit odd he also found the person that was leasing a cottage to susanna susanna lived there between 2000 and 2003 his name was michael and michael says that all those years that susanna lived in that cottage he would constantly hear her and frank fighting and the fights would get so bad that at one point he went to Frank and he told Frank like you know if you don't leave Susanna alone I'm going to call your wife and tell her about the affair that you're having and after that Frank after that sorry Michael decided to call Sybil and tell her about Frank's affair and this was about two days before she was murdered and when she answered the phone he told her like you know Frank's having an affair with one of his colleagues and she just replied yeah I already know and that's when the phone call ended. Susanna was also not excluded as a suspect and that's because she had a reason to want Sybil gone you know like if Sybil's gone her and Frank could have their relationship their relationship could be open they wouldn't have to hide it you know they could be a big happy family and then Pete received an anonymous phone call that Susanna was packing and she was planning to leave the country so immediately he hopped into his car drove to her office tried to get in but the security guard denied him said no and somehow he went to the back of the office managed to get in and find his way to Susanna's office and immediately she started crying and she said she had nothing to do with Sybil's death and that she was moving because she was scared of Frank and what Frank would do to her and their daughter. And after that she packed up all her things and she moved to Austria. After she had left, Frank had called Michael's wife, Michael was the guy leasing the cottage to Susanna, 
to find out where she had went and although Michael's wife had like an email address to contact her on she didn't want to give it to him because she was also scared about what he would do to her and the child you know she was like protecting her she cared about her safety and I think that says a lot about who Frank is as I mentioned earlier Eddie Bazinate who was Frank's ex-brother-in-law told the police officers that he had sold a crossbow to Frank in 1992 for only 300 rand and he also told them how Frank was very interested in martial arts and he was really like also pretty good at it however Frank denied that he had ever bought a crossbow from him or had like any knowledge of it after everything that he had discovered up until this point, Pete then decided to focus on Frank. And his first question that he had was whether or not Frank would have been able to be at the crime scene. So Sybil had been murdered at around 1935 and Frank said that he arrived home at 1940. Immediately that would rule him out as a suspect. However, the electronic card entry that's at the estate that he stays in shows that he only arrived at the estate in 1954. And when they asked his domestic helper Margaret what time he arrived, she said that he arrived at 8 or just after 8. And that's because that's when generations started. And we all know, you know, if you're South African, that generation starts at 8 every night. However, in a later statement, Margaret told them that Frank tried to convince her that she was mistaken and that he had gotten home way before 8 and that he had been in the garage doing some exercises and that when he got into the house, the twins were asleep and she was asleep in her chair. But she denied that she was like, no, that's not possible. I was awake. I was in the kitchen and generations had just started. One of Frank's neighbors also said, that a couple of months after Sybil's death Frank had went over just trying to like persuade him or like plant a seed in his mind so basically Frank went next door and he was like to his neighbor you know I'm a suspect in my wife's murder and police officers might come over and ask you guys a couple of questions and then Frank kind of reminded him like you know remember that night that Sybil died you saw me outside at around like half past seven with the twins and you asked us like why we're still up and the neighbor was like I don't like I didn't see you that night I know I didn't see you that night like you know like what are you saying Pete then tried to determine whether Frank would have been able to commit the murder in the given time frame. So the first thing they had to do was kind of calculate Sybil's trip. So they calculated when Sybil left the house at 7 p.m. and arrived at the Strables at around half past seven. And when they do this, they drive according to the speed limit. Like they don't speed and they even drove like slower as well. I think the speed limit was 60 kilometers per hour they were driving 57 kilometers per hour and they got to the Strables at around 1930. Then they looked at the crime scene, spent a couple of minutes there, then they got into the car and drove from the Strables back to the Waterford estate. This time they decided to increase their speed because they thought that was what the killer most would have likely done after they had killed someone. And they did this and they left the Strables at 1935 and they got to the Waterford estate at 1952. Meaning it would have been possible for the killer to have gotten to have gotten to the Strables, murdered Sybil, and then gotten home before 1954, which is what the card entry showed. The third trip they were taking was from Frank's workplace to the Strables. And according to Frank's statement, he left the office at seven on the dot and according to the card entry he only got to the estate at 19.54 so they went from his work office to home and that didn't take long i think it took about 20 minutes so they were like hmm the timing is a bit off if you only got home at 19.54 but when they made the trip from frank's work to the estate via the strables 54 minutes made sense and they concluded that it was highly possible that Frank could have murdered his own wife. 
Now that Frank's alibi had some holes poked in it, in September 2003, the Zanners decided to hire a private investigator to look into Frank's alibi, you know, and kind of try and make it make sense. The gag is the private investigator they hired was someone that Pete Bailafelt used to work with. So obviously he knows this guy is good. And after this, it was sort of like a game of cat and mouse between two ex-partners. One day he randomly received a phone call from this private investigator that like kind of gave him a clue, like an anonymous, an anonymous tip. And he was like, how about you go to Frank's work and look at the footage and see what time he exactly left the office. And Pete Bellafort was like, hey. So he went there, but the footage was literally missing. It was missing. So that was just, um, however, with all this information that he had gathered, Pete Bailafelt was pretty confident that Frank Gazana had murdered his wife, Sybil. And finally, on the 28th of August 2003, Frank was arrested for the murder of his wife, Sybil's son. Whilst waiting for Frank's trial to begin, Pete discovered that Frank had been involved in another murder 13 years earlier at his father's factory called S.A. Linishers. So what had happened was that Frank had picked up a measuring tool and threw it at one of an employer's head and his name was Samuel Sejato and unfortunately he passed away and as soon as Frank hit him in the head with this measuring tool he ran up to him pulled it out but unfortunately Samuel didn't make it and Pete also managed to trace two eyewitnesses and with that he went to the judge and he managed to make Frank's trial be for two murders instead of one, for Samuel and for Sybil. The reason why Frank wasn't charged with murder all those years ago was because the judge couldn't make a ruling. So just like left it at that, you know? On the 26th of July, 2004, Frank Zana stood before the court for the murders of his wife, Sybil Zahner, and a worker, Samuel Sihad. The two counts were being heard simultaneously, but they first started with Samuel and they got an eyewitness to tell them what happened on that day. And the eyewitness said that on that day, Frank had been calling another worker and they had had an argument a couple of minutes or hours before that. So he had called this worker about three times and the worker didn't answer him. So Frank decides to pick up this measuring tool and throw it at that worker. But unfortunately, it missed that worker and hit Samuel instead. The judge then heard about Sybil's murder. I forgot to mention earlier in the video that Pete had found two eyewitnesses. It was a mother and daughter and on the night of Sybil's murder they had went out grocery shopping and on their way back the daughter had seen a white bikey driving past and then when she looked back again she saw something lying on the floor and Pete had the question of whether like if this person was already on the floor why would the bikey just like drive past them and not stop so they thought it had something to do with the murder however whilst they were on the stand it was discovered that neither the mother or the daughter could positively identify the bikey the second thing was that there were no actual photographs of the crime scene because obviously they botched the investigation so they only had reconstruction they only had reconstruction pictures of the crime scene they also had Susanna on call from Austria just in case I wanted to bring her up onto the stand but the prosecution never called her up Frank's domestic helper also went back on her statement and she told the courtroom that Pete had forced her to write that statement and that you know like basically she lied in that statement so what she said about him about Frank arriving home at around 8 it was a lie and then the neighbor that had told them that Pete had come that Frank sorry had come over and just tried to like plant a little scene them he said he also wasn't too sure about that and about what time Frank got home so it was just like one blow after the other 
for like prosecution just everything that could go wrong was going wrong Eddie who said he had sold a crossbow to Frank in 1992 because of his criminal past was said to be deceitful untruthful so that just poked holes in his story and caused reasonable doubt. The forensic pathologist they had first thought that the bow that had been struck by like that had been in Sybil's neck, he first believed that the force was by hand. So the person that had thrown the crossbow hadn't necessarily thrown it, but they had used their hand and stabbed her. And that wasn't true. It had been like shot at her. So there was like back and forth between the prosecution, the defense, that also created reasonable doubt. And the nail in the coffin was that they didn't have footage of Frank leaving his workplace so they didn't have the exact time that he left his office and they already had like the card entry time which was 19 which was 1954 and they had managed to get the company that had like created that software to come in and kind of talk about how truthful it is like it doesn't make any mistakes but during cross-examination they kind of went back on their statement and they were like you know what it's a possibility and maybe it malfunctioned and the times weren't correct so everything was just not going well it was just wasn't going well during this trial the prosecution then applied for acquittal stating that Frank had no reason to kill his wife Sybil and that in fact she had forgiven him for his affair and accepted the child that he had had with his mistress. They also said that the defense hadn't been able to prove without the doubt that he had killed Sybil and that his alibi was false like they couldn't prove that. On the 1st of August 2006, the state dropped their charges against Frank Zana for the murder of his wife, Sybil Zana. And three days later, on the 4th of August, Frank Zana was found not guilty of murdering Samuel Saketsu. And the reason why is because they said that he hadn't thrown the measuring tool at Samuel's head with ill intention you know like it wasn't intentional he didn't mean to murder him so yes he did kill him but it wasn't intentional three years after being charged Frank Zana walked down those courtroom steps as a free man in 2010 Frank sued the state 8.5 million rand in damages just everything like mental reputation just like everything you can think of, you could sue the state for going to trial. He sued them and in another development, Frank's claims of 2 million rand against two pension funds, both in Sybil's name, were rejected. The two companies had also created a trust fund for their twin boys and once Frank was acquitted, he kind of came back and told them that they couldn't do that. You know, companies aren't allowed to do that. And he wasn't successful. Uh, last I checked in 2017, the trusts for the twins were still there and hadn't been touched. Sybil Zana's murder is still unsolved and Pete Bailafeld once said that this was one of the biggest fails in his career because he wasn't able to get a conviction against Frank Zana. Frank Zana, I don't know where he is today, but I'm assuming he's out. He's a free man enjoying his life and yeah we don't know if he did it or he didn't so please let me know what you guys think down in the comments whether you think he is guilty or not guilty i know this video was a little long so if you made it to the end thank you so much and please don't forget to also comment down below if you want to enter the giveaway so you can win this book so you can win this book and I can send it to you. Don't forget to do that. And please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.